welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at our monthly AI meetup. Uh, my name is Britt Ayot and I am part of the marketing and communications team here at Amy. Uh, more importantly though, I am an avid gamer, which is why I jumped at the chance to host this meetup uh, once I heard who was speaking. So more on that later, but uh, for now, just a few notes before we start. Um, we'd love to see your faces. So if you're comfortable, um, I'd like to encourage you to turn your camera on. Uh, we are recording the session so that others can check it out later. So uh, it's going to live on our website and on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to check out our other recordings, I'd highly recommend you do so. There's some really great content in there. And I can say that with uh, a complete lack of bias being the person who manages that channel. So uh, we have two amazing speakers today. Uh, following each of their presentations, there will be time for individual Q&A. Um, so you can either drop your questions in the chat box or feel free to raise your hands and ask your questions when Q&A rolls around. Uh, finally, our next meetup is scheduled for May 24th, which is during AI week. Uh, make sure you follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter to keep up to date. Um, AI week is really exciting. It's the first year we've done this. Um, it has something for everyone, including sessions, networking events, and socials for a range of ages and familiarity with AI. Uh, we'll drop the registration page for AI Week in the chat for anyone that wants to learn more. And uh, with that, let's get started. So first up is Levi Lelis. Uh, Levi is a fellow and Canada CIFAR AI Chair at Amy, an assistant professor in the Department of Commu Computing Science at the University of Alberta, and a professor on leave from the University of Visoa in Brazil. He received his PhD in computing science in 2013 from the U of A studying under the supervision of Robert Holty, who I think is here today, uh, and uh, Sandra Zillies. So I'll hand it over to Levy now to share his screen and get started. All right, thank you so much, Brett. Uh, can you hear me all right? Awesome. So let me push play and hopefully you can see my full screen right now. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, thank you for the for the introduction, and I'll I'll be talking about a very specific project that um, we did in my in my research group at the U of A. Uh, we have many people involved. I will mention their names uh, in a in a couple of, of slides. So the the title of the talk is uh, "Generating Curricula for Human Learners," and before we we dive in, into all the the details of the of the project. I just wanted to motivate a little bit uh, why we're doing this kind of work, uh, which is also related to other works that we're doing uh, at the U of A. Um, so th this is a scene from the movie AlphaGo, which I, I, I quite enjoy. So in, uh, in the movie, we have Lisa Dahl playing uh, the game of Go with uh, AlphaGo. And then they played five matches. I'm sorry if you haven't seen uh, the movie, I'm going to give you a spoiler. But uh, Lee Sidol loses the first match, and then this is a scene for the second match. So Lee Sidol is uh, smoking a cigarette at the top of the building. Uh, he is clearly very concerned because he lost the first match. And once he gets down from the top of the building and he sees what is known today as move 37, then he has this uh, facial expression. He looks very uh, surprised. And um, the commentators on site, they, they say that this is the kind of move that nobody makes. It's completely unexpected. So he looks very, very surprised. And then uh, he also looks very hopeful and uh, he seems to be happy. I might be thinking, hey, I got this. Uh, now I got to win this match. But then after a little while, he realizes that was actually a pretty good move. Uh, and AlphaGo ends up winning the second game as well. So this is an instance of a learning system that learned how to play the game of Go by playing the game of Go with itself, and then it was able to surprise and uh, defeat one of the best Go players uh, in the world. So in my, in my research group, we're looking into ways of how we can uh, transfer this machine-generated knowledge uh, to people. So how can we learn uh, out of the knowledge that's being generated by, by these machines? And in this particular project that we're going to talk about here today, we, we try to do so by generating what we call a curriculum. So we have a system that will learn how to solve a set of problems. And then the system will generate a set of uh, problems that will allow us to learn how to solve the problems by solving them. So that's what we call a curriculum. And one of the main motivations that we had and the, the, the game that we used to, uh, to test our system was the game uh, The Witness. 
So if you if you haven't played The Witness, it's a it's a great game. It's this open world kind of game that you go around and you get to solve puzzles. And nobody's ever going to tell you how to solve the puzzles. You don't know the rules of the game before you start playing the game. And you learn the rules and you know how to solve the puzzles by solving them. So uh, here I'm going to show you a little video of myself playing the game. And um, then you're going to see that in the beginning, I'm kind of struggling because I don't know the rules of the game. But as I solve more and more puzzles, I get to, I get to learn how to solve uh, these puzzles. So this is joint work with a bunch of folks from the U of A and uh, from my university in Brazil, Vissosa as well. Um, and it was recently accepted at HKI. So let me play the video. And then uh, please try to pay attention on the rules of the game and try to solve yourself the puzzles as we go. So we have this all these panels and just the first panel is light up. And then we have this one puzzle and I try to solve it. And, and then I clearly fail. We have these blinking lights and say, hey, you got this wrong. And I try a couple of things before I actually manage to solve the puzzle. And then as soon as I solve the puzzle, then the next panel will light up and then I'm able to try to solve the next one and a set of puzzles in this curriculum that we, we had designed by the game designer. And you can see that the game designer is inserting new stuff as we go. So now the puzzles are getting bigger and perhaps you're getting a little bit more complicated, but I'm starting to understand what's going on. Maybe I have to go do like a zigzag in order to solve the puzzles. But then here I realize, hey, maybe, you know what? Maybe I need to draw a line so that I can separate the, the, the bullets from one color with the bullets from the other color. And I have to connect the initial point, which is a small circle, with this uh, little piece sticking out of the puzzle, which is the end point of the puzzle. Here, I'm just trying, hey, maybe maybe that's not uh, what I need to do. Let's, let, let me just try out. But then uh, again, I draw the line, I manage to separate them, and uh, I manage to solve the puzzle. And you can see the, pu the puzzles, they're growing in size, and um, they're getting a little bit more complicated as well as we go. Um, then we had that one that we went maybe, uh, clockwise, and then now we're going the other way around. Uh, so it's like the, the game designer playing with us and make sure that we, we see different instances and uh, we learn how to solve all these puzzles. So this one uh, is the last one in the set and it looks a bit more complicated, maybe due to the, the two empty cells that we have. So the two empty cells make uh, a little bit harder for me to find where to draw the line, but then eventually I managed to solve uh, this puzzle as well. Um, so this is a a great example of a good curriculum. So when I started playing the game, I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know the rules of the game. And then eventually I managed to, uh, to solve all the set of nine puzzles. And I learned uh, what were the rules of the game that we're playing here. Uh, as a teacher, it would be awesome if I could design a set of problems and then just give to my students, hey, you go, go out there and solve these problems. And then you're going you're gonna to learn AI as, as you solve them. Uh, that would be amazing. Um, and this is what we wanted the machine to do with this set of puzzles. We wanted to have a intelligent system that was able to learn how to solve these puzzles. And then at the same time, it would generate a curriculum set of problems ordered very much like the way that we saw here that would help us learn how to solve uh, the set of problems. So that's what we set up ourselves uh, to do. And then... Um, we get to use uh, two algorithms, and maybe what, what I'm going to show next is the, the most uh, technical part of the talk, and I'll try to make it as easy as possible, and then we're going to go back to the non-technical part of the talk. So we're going to be using uh, a tree search algorithm, which is known as Lab in Tree Search, and a learning algorithm that's known as the, the bootstrap. And um, we start with a set of what we call a training uh, tasks. And those are the figures that you see on the left-hand side, the initial set of tasks. So we, we have all those uh, problems. They are randomly generated by our system. We can randomly generate thousands of different puzzles. And then in the middle, we have the search algorithm at the top, LTS, which is being guided by a neural network. So this neural network is giving us a probability. It's like, let's say we're drawing our line, and then we get to a place where the neural network will say, hey, you have 90% probability of going up and finding a solution, or you have 10% probability of going right and finding a solution. So LTS, Live Entry Search, it's able to use that information to guide the search and then hopefully find a solution uh, more quickly that way. And we start with a neural network that's uh, totally not trained uh, at all. 
so it's a, uh, it's a, it's a weak way of guiding the search because we have no clue what's going on. But then we're still gonna, gonna try to solve these problems. And then the number that you see at the bottom of the neural network box, that's what we call a budget. You can see this as how much time we allow the system to think about the problem and try to solve it. Like a two is a small number. So we want the system to try to solve it really quickly. If it's unable to solve the problem, it's just gonna say, hey, I wasn't able to solve this problem. But then later on, we can increase this number and allow more time so that the system can solve it. So then uh, the procedure that I'm describing here is a procedure of the bootstrap system. So we're gonna go through each one of these instances and we're gonna give it to the search algorithm. And the search algorithm will get this instance, we'll try to solve it given this budget and also the neural network. Some of the instances, they're very easy. And once we solve them, they become training data. Like very much like the first instance in the, the panel of the video I showed you, all I have to do is just cut across and then in one move, I'm able to solve the problem. And um, so these instances, they become training data. We know how to solve them. I know that I need to connect the left-hand side with the right-hand side, and that's a solution. But some of the problems are actually too hard for our current system. Like our current system hasn't learned anything yet about this problem. So then if we fail to solve those problems, we just put them back in the initial set of tasks. So then we put it back. Some of them we're able to solve. The ones we're not able to solve, we just place them back uh, in our initial set. Once we have gathered some training data, then we give the training data to the neural network so that hopefully now our probabilities for solving the problem, they become better because we got to see some solutions. And then whenever I see a similar puzzle, then I know how to solve that puzzle because uh, I have a, a better neural network guiding my search. And then once I update my neural network, so hopefully now I'm able to solve more problems, but then it might happen that eventually we, uh, we just fail to solve all problems. We fail to gather more training data. So then I just allow more search time. So instead of uh, searching for, uh, let's say two minutes, I'm gonna search for four minutes and I'm gonna allow more time for uh, the search algorithm. And then I try again and eventually we're gonna solve all these instances. So all the instances that we had, uh, they become training data. And once they become training data, I can update my model. So it's this loop where I try to solve instances, the ones I solve, they become training data, and then I update my model, the model becomes better, and then I can solve more problems. And what we get out of, out of this procedure is a ordering of the instances. So there are those instances that we're able to, to solve first, and then uh, after training the model with those instances, then I can solve some more. So I'm getting an ordering of the instances according to the system. So it's how the system perceives the difficulty of all these instances uh, that we had. So we're gonna use that information in order to generate a curricula that hopefully would help people learn how to solve uh, these puzzles. So that was our hypothesis, that the difficulty found by the search algorithm with the learning system uh, would be helpful for us to help uh, uh, humans solve these problems. And we set ourselves to solve uh, two problems. So the first one, uh, it's an easier kind of problem where we're going to be given a set of uh, instances, like the nine instances that we had in the, in the game, The Witness, the one I showed you in the video. And our task is let's order them in a way that we're going to have the easiest instance for the system as the first one, the second easiest one as the second, and so on until we get to the hardest one. And that will be the last instance that we have in our, in our curriculum. So that's the first problem that we're going to try to solve. And the second one is where we're given a large set of uh, problems and we have to order them and select a subset of those problems and the subset will uh, form a curriculum. So in our experiments, we give the system thousands of problems and then we select nine uh, out of those thousands of problems to form a curriculum. And uh, folks, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have questions. I should probably open up the chat here to make sure I, I, I know what's going on. All right. Um, so this is the, the solution of the system for the ordering problem. So we're, we give the system the nine puzzles from the witness, 
and then it comes back the ordering and this is what we see so maybe you won't remember you've seen the video only once or maybe you played the game and then you remember but this is exactly the ordering that we had uh, for the game so that was the first good sign that we had in this research was that the ordering found by the system was the same one that was designed by the game designer that was clearly trying to help uh, the players learn how to solve this the set of puzzles so this is uh, the, the first positive result that we had and then now for the second problem we um, we give a bunch of problems to the system the system learns how to solve them and then now we're going to select a subset of those instances and we did something very very simple to select a subset so let's say that we're given thousands of puzzles and this line is representing uh, the set of puzzles that we have. On the left-hand side, we have the easiest one, the first one solved by the system. On the right-hand side, we have the hardest one, the last one solved by the system. So then let's say that we want to select five instances. We go, we select the first one, we select the last one, we select one in the middle, and then one in the middle between the first two, one in the middle between the last two. And then uh, that way we're going to select a diverse set of instances according to the difficulty perceived by the system. So we got the easiest one, we got the hardest one, and we got some other instances uh, in the middle. Instead of doing five, we did nine so that we could run a user study and compare with the uh, curriculum that was designed by, uh, by the game designer. And oops, so we have to go through the animation again. But I want to show you the set of instances that we, we selected that way. So these are the instances that we select this way. Uh, we call the equidistant uh, approach because we're getting uh, instances that are uh, uh, spaced out uniformly in, the, in this line of difficulty uh, according to the system. So we can see on the left-hand side, we have the easiest one. Uh, it's the same one that we had in the, in the witness. None of the other instances, there, they match the instances that we had in, in the game, the witness. Uh, but you can see that the puzzles, they get a little bit harder as we move to the right. And I don't want to spend too much time here because I want to spend a little bit of time on the hardest instance. So in the previous slide, I showed you the, uh, uh, the curriculum and I also showed you the, the solution to all those instances. And this is the very last one, the one that we had on the far right. And uh, so let me show you a person from our user study trying to solve this problem. So I hope by now you have an idea of, of what, what are the rules of the, of the game, what they need to try to achieve. Like they need to draw a line so that we're gonna split the blue uh, uh, circles from the black circles. And uh, here the, the user is uh, struggling to, to find a solution. I myself, when I first saw this instance, I thought there was a bug in the code because I couldn't solve it myself. And I was seeing many, many uh, puzzles like every day. And I, I still struggle a few minutes to, to find a solution for, uh, to this one. So this is, this is nice because uh, what the system found to be very hard, it's also very hard for us. So this is a very difficult instance to, to, to solve and the system agrees. This is the very last one uh, to be solved out of thousands of puzzles that we provide the system. So another positive result that made us um, happy and uh, think about a user study that we could run uh, to evaluate all this uh, curriculum. All right, so um, we ran a user study and in the user study, we evaluated the, the following curricula. So the very first one is what we call the witness exact is exactly the same instances that we have in the game, the witness in the same order in which they appear in the, in the game, the witness. We also tried a uh, curriculum where we uh, change the order of the instances in the curriculum. We just flip them randomly, and then each participant with this uh, curriculum will get a different ordering of the of the instances. So this is an, an example, and of the curriculum. And then we have the reverse where we go the other way around. So we start with the hardest one and we go all the way to the easiest one. Uh, poor folks who got this, this one curriculum, but we want to make sure that the, the ordering is really pl playing a role here of uh, um, how people learn how to uh, solve these problems. We have one that we'll call all random, so we didn't use the instances from the game to witness, we just select randomly from uh, thousands of instances, and the order is random uh, as well. And we have the equidistant, which is uh, the one selected by, uh, by our system.
So that's the one that we have at the bottom. If you're curious about the solution of the last instance, now you can take a look at it. Uh, there's this uh, one tricky part where we, we have to cut through bullets of the same color. And that's a feature that's really rare in these puzzles and make them really hard uh, to be solved. And the system agrees and finds it to be very, very hard. All right, in our user study, we ran this for more than uh, three years, collect data in uh, Lab in the Wild. And we got 685 uh, participants. And each participant, once they joined the, the experiment, they would be randomly assigned one of the five curricula. They would go through the nine uh, puzzles of each curricula. And then, uh, sorry about that. There's a little bit of delay here. OK, there you go. Once they finish the, the curriculum, they would try to attempt to solve three uh, test uh, instances. And the test instances, they were uh, the same for, uh, for all participants. So I just want to give you the, the highlights of the, uh, of the user study. And so uh, we measure what we call a dropout. So the, the participant, they would join the experiment, and they could quit at any time. And if the person uh, quit the experiment before getting to the test instances, we call them a dropout. And uh, the witness refers where you try to solve the hardest instances from the, the, the witness game, and then you go to the easiest one, uh, had the, the highest dropout rate uh, with uh, all random as well. So many, many folks, like 60% of them, they would drop out uh, in the middle of the experiment. And that makes sense. Like it's really frustrating. Uh, nobody told you the rules and you have to learn how to solve these puzzles and you have no idea how to do it. But uh, it was interesting also that we didn't see any difference at all in the number of instances solved across all curricula. And here, this is very likely due to a survival bias. So all the folks that quit once they get the, the witness reversed, they, uh, uh, they, they're changing the distribution of people that we see trying to solve the test instances. So maybe those folks that got to the test instances, they love solving puzzles. They're going to try really hard. And uh, then we have this survival uh, effect uh, going on here. But we also measured uh, other metrics. Like, for instance, we measured uh, the user effort, like how much effort they have to, uh, to, uh, to, to go through in order to solve these instances. There's a little bit of a lag here, uh, but hopefully you can see all the, all the letters fine. Uh, so equidistant, which is the, the curriculum generated by our system, needed the, the fewest attempts in order to solve the test instances. So an attempt is when you try to solve the puzzle and then you could give up and say, hey, I wanna start from the beginning. So you could clear your line and try uh, from the beginning. So if you try many, many times, it shows that you're struggling uh, to, to solve the puzzles. So the equidistant was the, uh, the one curriculum where people, they, they needed fewer attempts uh, to solve them. But it was also interesting to see that the same curriculum also needed more backtracks to solve instances from the curriculum. So a backtrack is when you go with your line and then you go back. So you think, hey, I'm, I'm going to the solution. Hey, actually, uh, I'm not. So let me go back a little bit and try to correct for the mistake I made. So that's a backtrack. So a large number of backtracks also shows that uh, people, they struggle uh, trying to solve those problems. And uh, this is indicating that equidistant is a, is a hard curriculum. But it's also interesting that it doesn't have a very high dropout rate. So it's hard because it requires more backtracks than any other curriculum, but uh, it doesn't have a high dropout rate. So that's indicating that maybe it's well balanced. Like the distribution that we get from the line, it's allowing the, the participant to feel good about themselves. Hey, I'm making progress. I managed to solve these many uh, instances. So maybe I should just keep trying. And that's a property that we're looking at in a curriculum as well, so that people can feel motivated to continue uh, doing their work. So these are a few highlights that we have from, from our study. And what did we learn? So let me summarize here, is that this uh, machine-generated curricula, they can be effective. Uh, we saw that uh, the curriculum that was generated by, by our system, it was harder than the others but it also allowed the participants to solve more easily uh, the test instances. Okay, and um, so they were harder, but they had a similar dropout rate. So that suggests that the curriculum is well-balanced and um, people seem to be better prepared. 
So folks, that's, that's what I have prepared uh, for today. I, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the, the funding agencies here and I'll be happy to, to take questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Levi. Um, so I'll, I'll kick off our Q&A. We have about five to seven minutes here. Um, how is this applicable in real life? How do you, how do you see this uh, actually, actually rolling out? Yeah, no, that's a, that, that, that's a good question. Um, so we could we could say that the, the game itself it's uh, it's real life like uh, this could be used in in game design uh, if you want to design a good curriculum for a video game then uh, we already have the right tool uh, to design uh, this uh, this curriculum but we we do foresee this being applied to other problems like um, if we had a system learning how to solve math problems then maybe you could create a curriculum of math problems that would help students uh, uh, learn new concepts in, in mathematics by, by solving these problems. So maybe the, the whole framework, the, the idea of learning and separating all these instances uh, could be applied to other problems, but uh, that's uh, yet to be seen. We, we would have to, to test this to make sure that it does work. It'd be cool to see some more engaging tutorials for sure. Exactly, yes. Um, I guess, so how would you like improve your chances uh, for the AI to generate like clever, interesting puzzles rather than relying on randomly generated ones? Yeah, that, 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 that's a good one. Uh, so currently we get this bunch of puzzles that were randomly generated and we hope to find something as awesome as uh, the very last instance that we had here, where uh, we have this special feature that only comes once in a while because uh, the feature is really rare. But it would be really nice if we could get, let's say, the neural network that we train, and then we're able to somehow inspect what's going on behind the scenes there and be able to generate a puzzle that would be tricky for the neural network. So then we would be trying to be an adversary to the neural network. Like uh, the neural network knows how to solve a bunch of puzzles, but then now we're going to try to find all those transitions for which the neural network would have a very low probability. Because as soon as we have a very low probability for one of the transitions, then uh, the search becomes harder and the whole system will struggle uh, to solve them. And that could show, could point towards uh, more interesting uh, instances that we can, can try to learn from. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Does anybody else have any questions? Thank you so much, Britt, for, uh, for the invite. Uh, this was fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Libby. Uh, OK, so uh, our next presenter is Devin Sigurdsson. Uh, he's a master's graduate from the University of Alberta, where he studied real-time heuristic search algorithms. After grad, he joined Inflections Games as an AI programmer to work on Nightingale, an upcoming shared world survival crafting game, which looks amazing. You should check out the trailer if you haven't already. Uh, and most recently, he has joined BioWare as an associate technical director working on the latest Mass Effect, which I am personally so excited about. So take it away, Devin. Hey, thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, as you mentioned there, I was I uh, graduated from the U of A about four years ago when I was doing my master's. And uh, since then, I've been working on game AI, doing game AI related things uh, in industry. And I wanted to kind of walk through an example of creating, you know, a really simple feature for game AI and discuss sort of some of the systems that are at play and also my personal experience going from doing more academic research and uh, working on things in a lab to trying to get these implanted in a game that you know, players are going to engage with. Um, so just quick disclaimer, obviously, everything here I'm going to show, unfortunately, is just going to be using Unreal Engine example content. Uh, none of this stuff is, you know, Bioware or Mass Effect. It's just simple example content to give um, a bit of a grounding on the type of work I'm going to talk about. Uh, and when I'm talking about sort of AI and uh, characters, I'm talking more about like ones you want to see existing in the world or living in the world, uh, things you might see in like a role playing and adventure game where they're going to be moving around, kind of trying to act in a believable way. Uh, the problems they talk about here and solutions likely will be applicable to other genres and other games, but uh, not always. Sometimes you're going to have just a totally different use case. You're making a game like, you know, Civilization or a board game and a strategy game. 
your problem space is very different than the problem space I'm going to be talking about. So uh, let's look at a very simple task here. We, we want the AI to follow the player. Uh, I'm sure all of us have played a game where you got a little companion friend or someone who's going to kind of chase you around and help you out and go with you where you want. Um, that should be simpler. Right? Like this is a problem that I think we can all think about how we would solve. You know, it's going to pick a location. It's going to move there. Uh, how long would we expect this to take? You know, is it going to be a couple hours to implement this feature? Maybe a day, a week, month? Uh, giving these accurate estimates are one of the kind of first things I noticed uh, really changed when I kind of came out into industry. Uh, in research, we kind of accept that things are hard and things might not be knowable and they'll take kind of as long as they take sometimes. Uh, we can't plan that way. So you're often looking at a project and saying, well, I need this feature to be done in three months because this other team's going to have to pick this up and move with it. And we need content made and it's got to get out to the outsourcing communities. Um, and we really need to be able to give these accurate estimates for how long things can take. Uh, and this can be a very difficult task when you start looking at all the systems involved in making an AI or making a character, especially when you're not really sure about the state they're in, how much technical debt is left there? Are they, you know, really clean and modular? Are they easy to operate on? Are they exposed out in a way you can work on them? Uh, so I'm gonna take this simple example of creating a behavior where the AI follows a player and look at some of these systems at play uh, that we'd use in sort of modern game AI. Uh, the first one, we're gonna have to author this behavior. We're gonna have to have a way for designers to describe it, to be able to kind of specify what should be going on? There are many options for how we might do this. We could use something like a state machine where we describe states and transition logics and predicates for how we'd move between them. We might look at a utility AI system where we're gonna rank you know, all these actions I could possibly take and score them and filter them out based on whether they meet certain conditionals. Or another common approach that uh, you know, is quite design friendly is to author a behavior tree. Uh, as the name implies, this is a tree-like structure that defines a behavior. It's a very common approach. I think it was first used in uh, Halo 1 uh, and has really grown in popularity since then. Um, if we look at this simple example of trying to have the follow behavior, we have a root selection. These selectors are basically going to try and run everything from left to right and stop at the first time they succeed. Um, we have decorators, the little uh, blue node there. This is basically a conditional to gate thing. Say, hey, if the player is not more than five meters, we're not gonna execute this uh, part of the tree and then sequences, which are made up of tasks. And we're gonna run left to right until we reach a failure and it'll return fail and go up. So if we fail to the move to, if we fail the conditional or we fail to play the animation, this sequence is gonna fail and the root selection is gonna move on to a wait. Uh, yeah. So when we're looking at this thing, one of the questions you can see here, we've got little nodes like player. Uh, we need a way to represent the AI state, represent the AI's version of the world. Uh, a really common approach is to use something called like a blackboard, basically a generic data store that systems can write to and update, you know, a clear representation of what is the weapon or what is the player without necessarily knowing about the AI using it or how it's going to be used, but just a simple spot we can store the data. This will have things from internal state to perhaps global variables of like, you know, is it nighttime, is it daytime? Uh, and different states like that. So we'll really take the player example. There are many ways we could simply, you know, we know the player, we know who they are. There's probably a global variable where you just reach out and grab it and start using that and uh, working on that data. Uh, a more sort of AI realistic behavior is to use something like a perception system or a sensory system where we want the AI to know about the player because it sees the player and it you know, can understand where they are and they can track his location because it's visible to them. Um, these perception systems basically will have perceivers register in and then emitters register in. You'll create these target pairs where we'll have a list of things we want to update. Uh, AI and performance in games always top of mind. So we can't do everything every frame. So we'll time slice that up and you will check where the player is maybe every few frames uh, to spread that out. We'll look at things for sight, for example, here we have the 90 degrees there, the player, or the AI can't see behind it, and it has a distance over so too far away, I won't check that. But once you get within that sort of in front of me-ish and near me-ish, uh, we'll do something like a line trace or a ray trace where we're going to check and look at our collision system, or our physics system, sorry, and say, hey, is there anything blocking this line here? Um, your level of fidelity is going to change a lot depending on like, the type of game you're making and how, you know, stealth really important. 
Maybe we need to bring in lighting. Maybe we need to add in other data. Should I be checking every finger? Or should I just look at the capsule root? Um, this is obviously going to vary dramatically between games. You don't always want a super complex solution because if you've got a simple game, you don't want to be burning CPU cycles, analyzing if it's dark enough or, you know, could I see the finger when really we just need a general sense that they could see them. So with that, we'll be able to update our Blackboard here and our uh, behavior tree. So every, you know, twice a frame, we'll grab the variables from the perception system and update our Blackboard. Uh, and then if we do know about the player, we'll move to it and player animation as before. Uh, and we're looking at this sort of move to, this is the next little node here I want to break up and discuss what, what goes into movement. You know, the U of A, uh, obviously amazing at pathfinding, has written a ton of influential papers on it, uh, but I'll still give just a broad overview of it. Uh, first thing we need is a way to represent the navigable space in the world. Uh, the, we used to use grids a lot for that, and grids are still used in uh, academic pathfinding quite a bit, but most game engines now have moved to uh, a navigation match which is essentially a uh, polygonized uh, version of the world where we can represent the connected polygons and each edge there represents free space. You can go anywhere in between those edges and you know we can connect there. Um, and then this will often be used to represent other data of the world. So we might have things like weights associated with these meshes. We might say like roads are you know less expensive than crossing a river so we can have the AI stick to a road and avoid rivers or fires. Um, then we'll look at the next system here. We're going to want to look at pathfinding. We'll run something, you know, maybe just a simple A star. So when we take this nav mesh and we say, I want to go to this thing, we run a search algorithm and it can give us a list of points. Say, hey, if you want to go from here to there, you got to go through these sections. Um, great. So we, we found this path. The AI is now moving around, running, chasing you, playing its animations, uh, running its path following algorithm. Uh, it's basically going to look and say, well, what's my next point here? How do I get there? Uh, we're going to have to then apply a velocity to its capsule or its movement system, update the physics. Animations is going to have to be driven down from this. So we're going to look at, well, if I'm moving at which speed, which animation do I play? And there's a ton to, you know, go from just that moving capsule to have it look a bit more uh, realistic. Um, one really important note that uh, kind of sneaks in a lot, uh, pathfinding and path following often don't care about sort of holonomics and motion constraints. Um, when you look at an edge like this, if you think of like a quadruped or a hippo or something that can't turn on a dime, it can very well run off the nav mesh and kind of get stuck, you know, maybe fall off the world. Uh, so these are sort of some of these considerations when you talk about how do we make a character move in a believable way, we have to kind of think about like, how does that character actually move in its space? Uh, doing proper search where we consider the movement set of the AI and integrating that into the search is interesting but super expensive and often not done you'll look at doing little corrections so we'll do some nav mesh ray cast and say if i were to run this corner wide would i go off the nav mesh okay if so then maybe i'm going to slow down as i head into this corner um so something as simple as following the path really starts to have lots of sort of tangential information where i need to know about the character about its movement set uh possibly about its animation space what animations are available does it have a turn on spot can it you know you know cut quickly um and you start kind of integrating these systems into each other. But you know, here we have it. We've got the player that can move around and chase you. Uh, the gift started at the end, but uh, it seems like you know you kind of figure out these systems and you get it to work. Uh, oftentimes, once you start putting this in a level, uh, you can get it work in a gym, no problem. And you you go to add a level, and you know the designers put in a narrow hallway where you go to get a gun, and all of a sudden you realize your system has now blocked the player, caused a bug. Uh, this is something that, you know, we kind of laugh at, uh, it's annoying, it's bad AI. Uh, this has been happening for 20 years in games. Uh, the latest games still have bugs like this where AI blocks you and it can be tempted to kind of look at that and say, well, that's just not very smart. That's not great AI decisions. But I think it's something kind of more nefarious about why these problems become hard and I'll uh, get to it in sort of, sort of the implementation, implementation details of how we actually go about building these systems that really make it hard to fix some of these bugs sometimes. Uh, so I'm going to walk through a really simple solution for something like this. We said just move to the player, and that's not really what we wanted. We wanted to express the AI is following the player as its friend, as its companion, and we need to pick a spot to go to. When I when I follow my friends on the street or whatever, I don't just walk as close as possible to them. I kind of use some way to guide the world and say, well, this is roughly close enough, and maybe I'm you know beside them or near a set, or it's a narrow street, so I'm following behind them. 
uh, we'll use something like an environmental query system, perhaps to probe out into the world and pick where we should go. Uh, so these query systems um, are using tons of games and basically they'll generate a list of probes that can then gather extra information about the world. Uh, from that, we're gonna score and filter them. So in this case here, we're gonna filter out anything that's not visible. I wanna pick a spot where the player can see me. We don't wanna you know, spend all this time and money building these really great characters that the player never sees because he falls behind you. And we don't want the player running backwards while we're trying to look at the AI and make a conversation. Uh, the next part, we're there, just a simple dot product. Let's have the AI in front of you. Uh, so here we have it. Uh, you can see the green nodes, they're scored higher. The yellow nodes and red nodes are behind me and to my left, and the blue nodes are filtered out. They're blocked by this wall. You can't see it. That's not a good place to stand. So you now we can use this type of system to kind of score and rank where we actually want to be in the world and how we want to interact with it. Uh, but it doesn't solve our problem. You, we can still easily block the AI. If we put this guy in a corridor, he would still stand in front of you, blocking you. Um, so why don't we use the nav mesh and mark it up and perhaps say, avoid the player. Let's make the area in front of the AI expensive. Um, so we might take something like this where every frame or few frames, the player is going to simply update its golden path, update where it's going. It's going to let the nav mesh know, hey, this is where I want to go and this is expensive. You got to make this expensive. Uh, so we can do that. We can take the nav mesh and you know, mark it up and say, hey, these are the polygons that the player is likely to go into next. We don't want to stand there. We don't want to go there. That's expensive. So we update our query to include that. We can see here in the example, uh, all those projection ones, uh, they've been filtered out. We projected the nav mesh and check out where we're standing. That's on the sort of the golden path of the player. Filter this out. You can't stand there. So when you pick this point, we're going to pick, you know, at the end of the alleyway. That's that seems reasonable. It's a far better solution. Um, so now this sort of simple task of movement, you know, we've started looking at this, it's perception, it's locomotion, it's animation. It's authoring a decision of, you know, follow the player seems like a trivial task and it is, but what we really meant was create a lifelike behavior where the AI kind of follows you in a way that makes sense and moves correctly, but doesn't block you. And we have to now infer player intent. Uh, where is the player going to go? How is it going to move? That's a very challenging problem to understand. Um, but we can do this. We can add in these picking the best spot. So every you know a few seconds or a few times a second, we're going to run the CQS query. We're no longer going to move to the player. We're going to move to the best location near the player. Um, one thing that might you know have caught your eye there: some of these polygons are giant. Uh, they're real big. Uh, so if we say this is a player we're going to go, he's going to go into this polygon here. We might end up saying, "Why are the AI always standing you know twenty feet away from me in an open field?" Uh, and we started kind of making these changes. We were kind of chasing down the, using our available systems to chase down the intent we want to author it can be very difficult where you cause these sort of unforeseen edge cases and problems where all of a sudden a simple solution now added a new problem. But, you know, we're, we're smart AI programmers. We know what we're doing. We might say, well, let's change the nav mesh configuration. Let's build smaller polygons, build more of them. That, that'll help. Although now memory is blowing up and search is now more expensive because we've added more polygons and that's not great. And what about other systems relied on the larger polygons? We don't really know. We're now saying we rely on small polygons. It's very equal, uh, it's equally likely that another system somewhere by someone else has needed big polygons. Uh, so we might want to localize that change and look at saying, let's update the nav mesh right around me. Let's update the polygons just near me. We'll pay the cost to rebuild that nav mesh. But we're just going to cut that up instead. And every few players or every few ticks or whatever, we're going to just build the area around me to represent the player's path rather than changing the global nav mesh. So when we go through this, like when you kind of give that estimate or heuristic, when your boss comes to you in your first couple of weeks and says, hey, I want you to add a behavior that has the AI follow the player. Like these tasks can be incredibly difficult for many reasons. You don't know what's going to be available to you. You might find that bug and perhaps the nav mesh isn't exposed out to you and you can't update it. You probably, perhaps you can't cut it in the way you want. Uh, and these simple things can really be complex because you're often working in a bigger engine in a bigger space where you don't have total control. It's not a small little box where you kind of make any decision you want without ramifications on other teams. Or if I change the, for example, like Unreal Engine or Frostbite Engine, adding divergences into how they implement their systems means when they put out a new feature, that's extra work. We want to go grab the latest version from Frostbite or uh, Epic. Now I had to go look at their changes, reconcile them with my changes of their engine, 
and slow that down. And if you go too far, you're going to end up being in a place where you just simply can't upgrade the engine. And you kind of look at the new features come and say, oh, that would be nice. If only we hadn't changed the av mesh to allow for cutting of a player, we could actually grab the new, you know, mass AI system or something. And another point here I just want to kind of go over is, it's something I don't think we talk enough about, uh, both in games and in academia, is sort of the implementation details of these systems really, really matter. Uh, this code kind of seems harmless, but there's two just major problems with it. Uh, first off, the player code here is updating the nav mesh. The player is responsible for updating this. What if we don't have followers? The player code here is still churning away, checking this out and updating it. Um, this might seem fine uh, at first, but you know, if the person who wrote this quits and we remove followers, you might look at this and say, I don't know why we're doing this. It has nothing to do with the player. I have no idea. It doesn't express the intent of, hey, we're doing this so that the AI can avoid it. Um, it offers nothing. It's just the a very mechanical system going on here. The player, every frame updates it, and there's no way to really understand why we're doing this. It could be for a thousand reasons. So if you go into someone else's system, especially on kind of older code bases with lots of people working on it, it can be very hard to grok why we're doing some of these systems. And it's really important to express clearly the reason for the code existing. And the second thing here uh, that probably should raise red flags is the nav mesh knows about the player. We're passing in the player to the nav mesh. Uh, that doesn't seem right. That should kind of scratch that issue of uh, separation is concerned. Like, if we want to go delete the player now and someone says, hey, we're going to change from the player class to a new class, all of a sudden, you have to go into the nav mesh and update the nav mesh to be able to make this change, remove the player. So, like a simple task that can really grow out because you have to pay down this, what I would call a technical debt or um, refactor the code base. And it can kind of become a bit of a dirty word if you are careful, because every time you go to make a simple change or request from your manager and you say, well, we ought to refactor the code base to allow everything, it can get to a bad point where simple changes take months because you haven't been careful of building up your systems, kind of following best software architectures. Uh, and I say that like, this is a really important area because it just isn't talked about. There was a good GDC talk from Ben Sunshine Hill a few years ago that kind of talked about creating reliable AI and the implementation details and how we can run conflict pitfalls. Um, but it just isn't something I think we kind of discuss enough about. So let's clean, clean up this implementation a little bit here quickly. Um, let's not have the player know about the nav or the nav mesh know about the player. Let's bring that out. So you might think, well, no problem. I'll grab the polygon at the player's location. I'll mark that as expensive. And this is better, but now if you want to go change the nav mesh, let's say we want to move from a nav mesh to a grid or something, now you got to update the player because the player still knows about the nav mesh and that doesn't feel right. Like the player shouldn't care about the navigation data or the AI data being used. It really is a separate system. Um, so we can clean this up a bit better. Uh, this still isn't perfect, but when you have these kind of two systems where they're really independent, you might want to look at like a third layer where you're going to interface in here and say, hey, I want to map this logical query of this area is expensive, these things are expensive to a mechanical thing where the underlying system needs to be updated. But now we can use sort of like a helper or you know, uh, interface class to say, mark this area as expensive around here. And I don't have to care about if that's nav mesh or a grid, we can swap those things out easily without having to update the player. There's a system responsible for taking this logical query and mapping it to a mechanical system and separating out those concerns. Um, yeah, so those are just a few of the sort of reasons why I think like, when we look at games, we look at these problems and we say like, hey, these are really easy things like we can all come up here and sit like you know any undergraduate class could go and solve some of these problems like why are they difficult why does it become challenging and it is this sort of interconnectivity of a thousand different systems at play dealing with it in very tight memory budgets where you have to both try and separate these concerns but pack your data in a way that you know it's cash coherent and all these things really matter when you're dealing with just a few milliseconds um but yeah that, that's basically my talk and uh thanks for having me Thanks, Devin. Holy moly. I hadn't realized there was that much of a domino effect for every single decision you're making. Yeah, you usually don't for like a year later and then you're like, well, shit. <laughs> I guess we're stuck. <laughs> um, I also assume that everybody else was experiencing the same like terrible flashbacks of broken immersion, sims stuck in doorways, like companions blocking the path. Mm. Uh, so that being said, what um, what currently unsolved like technical problem would you think would have the biggest impact 
better player experience and like decreasing that sort of broken immersion feeling? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I think one of the like, biggest pushes you're seeing now in sort of especially games like this is because we often try and separate these things out into mechanical systems, like you can't see it here, but we don't care about the mesh or the animation often. We have a nav mesh that finds a path and we move a capsule around and the animation here just follows the capsule and tries to do its best to um, match. So if the capsule's moving, it plays running animation. If the capsule's following, it plays a following animation. Uh, a lot of games now are kind of pushing that away and trying to have animation and other systems actually drive movement. So rather than having the, uh, the animation of the body here follow the capsule, the, ca uh, the animation is actually going to drive the capsule and drive its movement. So we're going to look at all the possible animations I have, and I want to move forward. I'm going to pick the animation with movement data in there and then drive that so you know the capsule moves at the exact speed of the animation. Um, it is both a very challenging problem because it's hard to do that efficiently, uh, and it requires a lot of data to do well. But it also comes back to this sort of like a lot of these systems are becoming very interconnected. In order to make good AI, you kind of have to have them all play together, which can make changes very slow and very difficult as you've added in these dependencies. Right. Oh, that's um so does any so does anybody else have any questions? Because I have one more. If I, I, I do. Hmm. Uh, Devin, do you think it would be possible to learn these behaviors from data? Like I've, I've seen psychology experiments where they have data of people walking on the streets. Uh, if you had like high quality data, could this be applicable here? Yeah, like I think like you could learn it and there's definitely like areas you can pull out of that or like Stephen Guy, uh, I can't remember their lab name, did a lot of really good work on force-based collision avoidance where they basically modeled pedestrian movement and looked at it and essentially came down to a time to collision detection. So, hey, we're both walking at this rate. We only start responding. Like when I see someone at the other end of the street, I don't react to move out of his way until we're like, you know, a couple seconds away from colliding and you could learn it. Uh, sometimes in the case of uh, Stephen Guy's research there, there might be a nice close form function that we can use. Um, but I definitely think it is doable. Just ideally, we find a nice, quick, efficient way that we can run it, you know, on hundreds of characters. Um, so obviously, we have a lot of really incredible talent here in Canada. Um, what would you recommend uh, we do in grad and undergrad schools that would uh, prepare game prepare students for working in on AAA games? Uh, I do think uh, Danielson Barbosa, I hope he's still teaching at the U of A. I was chatting with him when I was doing my uh, undergraduate internship. And one of the problems we often have with uh, your first kind of experience in uh, professional settings is you're working on code that's lived for a long time and you have to follow standards and you don't really have control over the full system. You, you're, not, you're not writing something that you throw away at the end of the semester. You're writing something that's going to have to live on long past your career. Um, and he suggested doing something like for a class basically make you have a contribution submitted back to like a large open source community. So maybe it's writing a new system for Epic, like you can push your changes back to them or TensorFlow would be another good example of having models that should be pushed up and accepted and kind of getting that close integration of, this isn't code that you write that you throw away at the end of the semester. It's code that you're writing for a bigger organization or community that has to live on. And it's not a like, we've all done this on our class projects where we really just do not care about good software architecture and we bash in whatever we need to get the project done on time. Uh, and that, that works well for undergrad and grad studies sometimes, you know, to get the paper out, but it definitely kind of doesn't teach you necessarily the right things of like, how do I both meet my deadlines, but also not screw over future me? Like you're kind of stealing from yourself when you do that. Not screwing over your future self is a good goal in general. Yeah, or teammates, as it often is, where you'll hear people complain about other people's systems because it makes their life hard. <laughs> uh, does anybody else have any questions? No? All right. Uh, well, then, we're two minutes to time. Uh, I'm going to call it and say thank you so much for joining us uh, for this month's AI Meetup. Uh, don't forget to check out AI Week, and I hope everybody has an amazing day.